What kinds of data are available at the HTTP archive and what kinds of insights can be gleaned? Well, given that the HTTP archive is just a big long list of like 300,000 plus URLs, so it's the data associated with kind of pinging every single one of those URLs as if you're hitting it from a web browser. So it's going to be um, how long it took to respond, uh, how many resources make up that page, so um, JavaScript, style sheets, images, uh, how big each of those resources are, uh, what the image formats are, even down to the level of uh, the, uh, I suppose, the JavaScript libraries that are getting used. So in, in terms of things that you can learn from it, you can get, it, it tends to be around averages. So when you hear someone say uh, in a, a, a session or on an article that the average size of a web page is now around 2 meg, chances are they got that from looking at the HTTP archive where you get a nice average from a pretty large selection. I mean, it's not the internet, but it's a, it's a pretty large selection. And being able to find out, say, uh, what JavaScript libraries our site's using. Uh, if they're using jQuery, are they using one version? Are they using more than one version? How do they perform the ones that use more than one version compared to sites that don't use jQuery, the sites that don't use any JavaScript libraries, the sites that just have vanilla JS? So you can kind of get a bit, bit more of a comparison and without having to do all that work yourself, see sites that currently exist, how they perform. Um, and then there's, there's a lot more information you can get in terms of averages and percentiles. So I said, uh, out of the Alexa top 1,000, maybe uh, try and work out what the 50th percentile is for sites that uh, load within one and a half seconds or something like that. So it's just being able to do a lot of data mining and work out a lot of averages, a lot of uh, the, the, the current state of a subset of the internet at a given point in time. So it's just kind of a monthly snapshot. And given that it's a monthly snapshot, you can see how those trends are changing month to month. So by tracking maybe the same URLs or looking at the same measurements, the same averages, how has that changed over, over several months? So you can see like the average page size just slowly going up and up and up and up. So teams would use this to decide maybe what tools or systems or such that they would want to use? I suppose it wouldn't necessarily drive the um, decision as to what tools and systems that they might use, but understanding where the sites that are getting bigger and slower, maybe try and find out, well, what are they doing? Are they using um, JPEGs that are not progressive or have not been optimized? Are any of them using WebP as an image format, which is not supported across all browsers, but is uh, much better in terms of optimization and performance? Um, so it's kind of understanding uh, from that level, I suppose. It wouldn't necessarily drive the decision to use certain tools, but it'd, it'd enable them to mine and look at, I mean, it's kind of cheating to look at someone like Twitter and Facebook and expect to get the same sort of performance. They're just, they've got millions to throw at specifically performance. But if you look at uh, smaller teams, really small development teams, and try and understand, they've got a really good rating. They've got, they're in the top, the top 1,000. I mean... That doesn't seem that great, but out of 300,000, that's actually incredible. So if you've got a small team who's in the top 1,000 based on uh, page speed, I guess, then what have they done? How are they doing it so well? When I look at their site, their site looks pretty good. So it's not just plain text, no images, Times New Roman. They're, they're doing something. So then as part of the talk that we're doing is uh, following up and talking to the, the teams and interviewing them and saying, that, that was really good, so how did you do that? And you get a vast amount of information. And, we, and then we try to distill it down to uh, some of the things that they're doing right and, uh, and try and get, a, I suppose, an agreement across a few teams and see what are each of these teams doing right. And I guess you can learn from it that way as well. Okay. And so a team coming to the HTTP archive for the first time, mm -hmm. what kind of advice would you offer them and how to approach it? Well, I mean, the archive itself is pretty huge. You've got um, each month there's another run, kind of around, it's a monthly run, and you can download this whole data in either CSV or MySQL backup format. That's pretty big. And if you're going to be looking through a huge CSV set of CSV files or a huge MySQL backup, you're not quite sure what you're looking at, that, that can be a bit daunting. Whereas when you combine it with Google's BigQuery, which is uh, just an online service to allow you to query large data sets, essentially, one of which is HTTP archive, they have other ones they support, so GitHub and 
I think it was like US crime statistics from a certain state just gets uploaded and you can query them. So by having just a nice little text box that you can type some SQL in and you can uh, see the structure of the tables in the HTTP archive, which when you expand it out, you can see, oh, so I can query on the number of requests. OK, let's see how many websites have uh, take more than 100 requests to make their home page, something like that. So being able to see the structure of the tables via something like Google BigQuery, and then being able to run those queries from within a browser and not have to download anything. You can run it from your phone. It's, it's incredibly easy to, to then really just keep running and keep iterating and keep trying new things and learning new things and getting getting insights into what's out there in this small subset. And so in your research, what are the biggest mistakes you're finding sites are making? There's a lot of mistakes. Um, but the, the, the worst offenders, they always tend to be around um, image use. So too many images. Images, I mean, there's some awful stuff there. Are, we, I do pick out some awful ones. Um, where it might be user-generated content, and the users have, have created uh, two meg images, and the website hasn't resized them. So they're serving you this page full of massive, massive images that are, are not optimized, they're not zip, they're not, they're the wrong format, and you just, oh, it just bloats the, the, the page all out of recognition. And then, equally bad, or possibly worse, depending on how it's done, is carousels. Now, no one really uses interacts with a carousel. So if you've got a carousel that's maybe three images, great. If there's another 10 images either side of those three, but no one's clicking on them, but you're still loading them, what on earth are you doing that for? It's a lot where it seems like it should be a simple thing. If someone actually looked at it and went, oh, is that what we're doing? Yeah, we probably shouldn't do that. Like carousels, don't do it. Turn it off. It's not hard. Or lazy load the images outside of the carousel. There's, there's plenty of options, but it, it is kind of a face palm moment when, when you just look at the sites and you see you've got 40,000 DOM elements, which means your page is now, uh, I don't know, it's infinite scrolling, but not in an intelligent way. It's just that your page is so big, you'd never get to the end of it. That, that can crash your browser. That can take forever to download. Think about someone on, uh, say, uh, they're roaming on, on their phone and they're trying to load the Microsoft homepage. And, uh, a couple of years ago, I did, a, I did a test on this. And to load the Microsoft homepage on like a 3G while you're um, uh, in America, but on a UK contract, would cost you the equivalent of like 20 pounds or something just to load a homepage. It's like just think about your end users here. They're, they're, if it's huge, if it's bloated, you're doing something wrong there. Yeah. And on the flip side of that, what are the best sites doing? Oh, there are some, there are some really clever, really clever sites out there. But it, the majority of the really good ones, what it comes down to is they're doing the basics well. They're, they're, there's a lot of people when, uh, when I talk to the development teams that are you, referring back to Steve Suda's uh, high performance websites book when they're saying, we're doing the basics. We're doing this and this and this. So um, minimizing HTTP requests, um, putting CSS at the top, JavaScript at the bottom, uh, using a CDN, gzipping, compressing where, where appropriate. It's 14 basic rules, and they're sticking to them. That's if, if you do nothing else, then do that. And then you've got teams like um, Filament Group who just do incredibly fast responsive web design for a living, so they've got to be good at it. And they're splitting it up, so they've got their critical rendering path where that's just everything that fits within one viewport, everything above the fold, is in one request pretty much. So it's all inlined, and then they load the rest of the, the CSS that would render the rest of the page uh, asynchronously, and then any JavaScript asynchronously. So you get that first hit, that first view of the page, incredibly fast. And then you've got companies like Smashing Magazine, and uh, they based a lot of their work off of the uh, redesign that Guardian did recently, the Guardian website, where they, they kind of have a similar idea around uh, critical, the critical path. They uh, split things into core, so that's uh, split into three sections. You've got core, enhancements, and leftovers. Core is above the fold. Try and get things to the end user as quickly as possible. Try and get it ideally within that first kind of that first packet, that first 14k, which is a key thing. Because then you don't need to do a round trip within the network. It's just it's one hit. That's the ultimate. Um, so that means no JavaScript. That means a minimum of CSS. That means um, kind of minifying your HTML as much as possible. And then you've got the enhancement bit in the middle, which is uh, asynchronously loading the rest of the CSS, asynchronously loading any JavaScript you might need. 
uh, any other WYSI gadgets, and you've got leftovers, which is like ads, metrics, tracking. So stuff that, if it doesn't load, yeah, sure, your marketing team are going to be unhappy, but it's not going to slow down the process. And they, they both took this approach. So, so Smashing Mag and Guardian have kind of redone their, their websites in such a way. And it's, I mean, that's real dedication. That's when you've got the time to do this properly. And it's coming up with that performance budget and having a performance strategy. So saying, from a performance budget perspective, saying, uh, I think both Guardian and Smashing Mag did this. We're going to have a speed index for every page. Must be lower than... 1500 for example and by setting that budget they can then if in a coding sense it would be breaking a build if the page goes over that and they can stop a feature from going live stop an article from going out for example if their budget is is uh, if they go over that threshold so they've got a strategy saying we will not go over this budget and to achieve that we're going to uh, if we do go close to that budget Remove an existing feature, optimize an existing feature, don't put the new feature in. You just kind of got those three rules. Again, this goes back to Steve Suda's book, this how to deal with things if you start to go over your performance budget. So it's, again, it's, it's kind of it's full circle. It's starting with the basics, going a long way around, defining a strategy, defining a budget, and then back to the beginning again, and making sure that you're monitoring everything that you're doing. If you don't, you, you get teams who monitoring the wrong thing and optimize the wrong thing, or don't, don't even monitor, actually. That's yeah, some of the worst things you've got. So going right back to your other question, teams doing things wrong, big pages, big images, don't monitor it. They don't know that they're doing things wrong. In the middle, you have teams that are monitoring, um, but monitoring the wrong things. So they're optimizing the wrong things. And then you've got teams doing everything right where they're monitoring the right things so they can optimize the right things and they've got their performance budgets in place. Right. There's a lot there. Yeah, you can't improve what you don't measure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you end up improving the wrong, or you think you're improving something, but you're actually making the thing you're not measuring even worse. I know, right. probably much. So in your research, what unique or particularly interesting approaches have you seen teams use to improve their performance? Well, I think really it was um, the filament group and the Smashing Mag um, sections there, where we've got some blog posts from Smashing Mag and, and, uh, and The Guardian, just where they're talking about this optimization of their sites and splitting up the the existing pages and being able to identify this is the core, this is the main bit of functionality, this paragraph, um, the layout of the page, the heading, that's all we want to get to the end user. And it's kind of understanding that, so we want to get an icon or a, a logo in that first hit. So we want to get that as quickly as possible. You kind of inline that into CSS and then put the CSS in line as well so it's not doing requests to other, other pages. But when you're doing that, that makes an image that wouldn't normally block the rendering, now it's going to block because Im images in CSS end up blocking. So you end up with this, this kind of trade-off of, again, you have to monitor, even to the point of, uh, say, use the real user metrics and have some um, uh, actual end user monitoring so you can see how these changes are affecting people within their browsers across various devices. But then in order to do that, you've got to load external JavaScript, which means you're already impacting that initial load. So it's, 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 it's kind of ha going back to having the strategy, having the budget, having understanding what the impact's going to be as you, as you make those changes. And so shifting gears just a little bit, you spend time teaching your daughter to code. Trying to, yes. Yeah. What tools and techniques are you using, and what kind of advice would you give other parents who would like to teach their kids? Right. Um, it's kind of tricky, though. Uh, so I've got two daughters. They're both quite young, uh, a two-year-old and a five. So it's, it's not like they're going to be sitting there doing their Ruby scripting or anything. But I was, kind of, I was inspired by a uh, presentation that was actually shown, I think, this year in the Santa Clara Velocity Conf. Um, I think uh, it was a girl, Jane uh, Ironman, I think, and her dad. Yeah, yeah who she was presenting the second half of it saying this is how I got into coding. It was all about getting um, more women interested in coding or, or getting girls interested so you got more women in the industry. And it had her talking about how they started off and defining an array of cuddly toys and being able to say that the cuddly toy to the left is the zeroth cuddly toy. The one next to that is the oneth cuddly toy. The one next to that is the second cuddly toy. 
and that, that defined an array. And having something that was real and that, that they could physically look at and work with, having like a post-it note on a table that said array one equals, and then your cuddly toys with post-it notes that said zero, one, two, being able to say, right, where is the, the second, which is the second cuddly toy? You know that that's the one, at number one. Interesting concept. Um, but what I've been doing with um, my daughters, I've just got the Robot Turtles game, where it's just kind of a board game, and you have to move uh, your turtle pieces around a board to collect a gem. That's about it. But it's all about um, giving instructions to your turtle. So it's move forwards, and you've got your little kind of up arrow cards. I'm going to make my turtle go forwards. And you've got a turn left card, and I'm going to make it go left. So once you've got it moved, you can get all of the moves that you created and kind of recreate the whole process that you went through. And it's kind of defining an instruction set. That works great with a five-year-old, not so good with a two. <laughs> Lots of chewing and throwing, things like that. But yeah, so starting with that. And then after that, once, um, once she's a bit older, I'm going to get her onto code.org. So I initially planned to get her interested in using the Raspberry Pi, because it's got a Raspberry Pi, it's got scratch on there, so it's kind of a drag and drop coding. But that's a bit too much like hard work. You can just go into a browser and go to code.org, I think it's code.org slash learn. And it's the same thing, it's basically a scratch. So you can drag and drop coding elements and make a little kind of a, a for loop and then drag some statements in there and see how that actually changes your little animated character on the screen. So it's going to be something a bit more, I don't know, a bit interactive, not just writing code. And then being able to understand within these blocks that I've dragged around, what is the code that made that happen? So we're going to try and move it on and move it on and move it on. But at the moment, we're still at the robot turtle stage. It's, it's starting with simple stuff. And yeah, so is that your advice for parents is to start basic? Yeah, I think, I think that the... the anchor things in the real world, so that kind of array of cuddly toys, I think that's brilliant. That was a really nice concept, being able to show something physical, which otherwise is kind of a tricky concept. I'm sure there are other ones that that, that would work for, but that one really stuck in my mind. I like that. That's interesting. So you've described yourself as a lover of shiny new tech. So what are you finding interesting these days, and what people, projects are you keeping an eye on? Well, it's not just um, literally physical shiny tech. I mean, I do love it when there's a new phone out, or a new tablet, or a new uh, laptop, or a new, I uh, like the, the new Tesla cars, where they're, they're just fascinating. They're just, it looks so complicated, and it, it, is, it is the future, like right here and now. But also, uh, the kind of the, the less physical stuff, the more virtual. So. I use Azure at work, and I've used Azure for years, and uh, some of my friends are like Azure MVPs, and being able to see what's going on, what's coming up, what's about to happen, I find this fascinating that within, it's only a matter of years that it's become so easy to kind of tick a box on a website, and now I've got a server that's running somewhere, and I can put a website on there, and then drag a little slider and say, now I've got 10 of them. That would have taken months before to go via a whole kind of the, the, the general IT purchase process of getting some physical servers, getting a managed process up there, getting, oh, I don't know, the, just the headaches that go along with that. But you can just kind of go to a website, click a few buttons, or even better, because I love scripting, that makes everything better. That means that I can go be redundant really quickly if I can automate my whole job. Um, being able to just have a script that says, oh, I need a performance test environment, right, I'm going to have one script that creates a database server, creates your data set, runs some tests against the website, and then destroys the whole thing and gives me a report in the morning. It's the changes that are coming through every week, something new seems to appear in the Azure portal, or something new appears on um, Amazon Web Services. And there's more competitors coming out, and the prices are changing, and there's now speed improvements, and there's just stuff happening all the time. It's just improving the possibilities for, for what, we're, what we're working on particularly for small companies like mine, for startups, where there isn't a huge budget. And we're just trying to do as best we can with what we've got. And if we don't actually have anything, we're just kind of renting it. That makes it that much easier. Interesting. Well, thank you very much for talking with me today. Thank you.